TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. The nuclear talks with Iran are reportedly off the table until after the midterm elections in the United States, drawing prospects for a plan B. Damascus accuses Jerusalem of striking Aleppo International Airport for a second time in a week. Russian President Vladimir Putin proclaims Moscow's intention to turn to the Middle East, Iran and India to avoid international isolation. The United States remains committed to a negotiated solution to the Iranian nuclear threat, but only under the terms that were laid out by the Biden administration. Speaking at a members-only event of the Foreign Press Association in Jerusalem earlier today, U.S. Ambassador to Israel Thomas Knights insisted that the White House cares deeply about resolving the nuclear conflict with Iran by diplomatic means, but in tandem it also does not intend to tie Israel's hands when it comes to defending itself against Iranian aggression. Uh, the President has articulated many times that he is desirous of having a diplomatic solution uh, to this conflict. We would like to obviously um, extend the JCPOA, but under the terms that the Biden administration has laid out. Uh, it's an important thing that we care about uh, deeply. Uh, the President has articulated many, many, many times we will not stand by to let the Iranians obtain a nuclear weapon. And finally, what's been clear, and I've stated this publicly two days ago, uh, and the President has articulated this both to Prime Minister Lapid and, and to the leadership of this government, that we will not tie Israel's hands and defend itself against Iranian aggression. It is important to highlight that the remarks by Ambassador Knights were made shortly after domestic media in Israel reported that U.S. administration officials conveyed to their interlocutors in Jerusalem that renewing a nuclear deal with Iran at present is off the table and will not be signed in the foreseeable future. Separately, a senior European diplomat confirmed that prospects of reviving the 2015 deal is not expected to happen before the midterm elections in the United States, which, if Iran's nuclear progress continues unhindered, will effectively render the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, obsolete. The European diplomat further laid blame on the Ayatollah regime in Tehran, which in its last response to the framework laid out by EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Defense Policy, Josep Borrell, climbed back up onto a tree from which it would be very hard to climb down. The European perspective is seemingly fully aligned with that of the United States, which highlighted remaining gaps as the cause for failure in bearing diplomatic fruit. Iran's response did not put us in a position to close the deal. Uh, we've consistently said that gaps remain, and it's clear from uh, Iran's response that these gaps still remain. It is important to know that the main point of contention remains the Iranian demands to close open investigations by the International Atomic Energy Agency into nuclear particles that were uncovered from undeclared sites in Iran. For over two years now, the Islamic Republic has repeatedly failed to explain the origins of the materials, with Tehran's responses repeatedly referred to by IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi as technically not credible. Consequently, Tehran accused the IAEA of being political and its Director General, or DG, a puppet of Israel, demanding a political decision to be made by the IAEA's Board of Governors, including its European members and the United States, to close the aforementioned probes as a prerequisite for the revival of the 2015 nuclear deal. And while the West responded by refusing to succumb to the Ayatollah regime's demand, IAEA Director General Grossi provided a response to the Iranians while being asked about similar allegations by Russia. If you look at other situations with other countries that I'm not going to mention now because they are not part of the discussion today, you will find the same thing. When people tend to like what we say, uh, they will praise us. When they don't like it, they will say that the DG is a puppet of whomever, or that we are being manipulated, or that we are... 
We are never manipulated. We, we never lose our north. We know what we, what we need to do, and we, we listen, of course, respectfully to all this noise, but our ability is to you know, keep focus on, on what we need to do. Uh, we, we are aware of the comments, and of course, um, it is very legitimate for member states to expect that the agency or myself will say exactly what they would like me, what they would like uh, the DG to say. Meanwhile, on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of Operation Orchard, in which Israel perpetrated an aerial strike on Syria's secretive Al Kibar nuclear reactor, the IDF has declassified materials which shed light into the sophisticated Israeli capabilities to destroy the nuclear aspirations of Damascus. Speaking on the matter, the then IDF Chief of General Staff, who recently served for a brief several months as Jerusalem's top diplomat, retired Lieutenant General Gabi Ashkenazi, provides some insight into the dramatic decision to act against Syria's nuclear aspirations and the extent of efforts to avert a consequent war. March 2007. I became Chief of General Staff a few weeks earlier. Amos Yadlin entered my office and placed the intelligence about Syria's nuclear program before me. I started a few weeks earlier. Half a year later, we completed the task. These were very significant six months for the IDF in its entirety, and I believe also for the defense establishment and, of course, for the State of Israel. It was obvious to me that what was placed in front of me was a nuclear reactor. It was obvious to me that this reactor had to be eliminated. It was obvious to me that we will need to try to do so in a matter that doesn't draw us into war, and that if there is a war, that we will win. It was very important for us that as part of the day that will come after the strike, it would catch, if I can call it that, Syria, and especially its leader, Assad, who is the decision maker in Syria, unprepared by surprise. The thing that was the most significant for me after striking the nuclear reactor was to ensure that the Syrians contain it, as much as the things are dependent on us, and to see whether all we thought about the manner in which the Syrian President Assad would react, we really succeeded in our assessment. We thought that it would provide for a chance, a deterrence for the IDF, of course, but we thought that it would provide for a significant chance that Assad would contain it, meaning he would deny that it was what it actually was and refer to it as an insignificant strike. And as the days went by, we saw that we really assessed correctly and tension slowly diminished. It took several days. General Ashkenazi went on to highlight that Israel's resolve against Syria is ample proof of Jerusalem's unyielding determination. I don't want to think which reality we would have faced in the north if Assad had nuclear military capabilities, or alternately, if those whom we are fighting would have laid their hands on these systems. Therefore, I think that we conducted a very important and rightful action that improved our situation. I think that the State of Israel cannot suffer that one of its neighbors would attain nuclear weapons, and I think that in this context we proved that we act when we talk. Meanwhile, in Israel's northern neighbor, unidentified aircraft conducted aerial strikes against runways of Aleppo International Airport last night as Iranian cargo aircraft were reportedly bound to land shortly thereafter, forcing it to redirect elsewhere. According to the regime-run Sana news agency, Damascus accused Israel of the attack, saying that its aircraft launched salvos of missiles from the direction of the Mediterranean, west of Latakia, which is an area known to be under control of the Russian Air Force. The Sana report further confirmed that material damage to the airport's runway has rendered it out of service, and Syria's aviation authorities are now being forced to redirect all flights to Damascus International Airport. It is important to note that the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm or deny the allegations leveled against it in response to TV7's request for comment. Nevertheless, it has been noted that Russia's frustration with the increase of alleged Israeli strikes against Iranian targets in Syria 
has triggered Moscow to demand of Tehran to freeze its activities and withdraw its proxy militias from military positions west of Syria's Hama province, among other locations. Nevertheless, thus far, Iran has seemingly not complied to Russia's demand, and the latter is evidently in need of its partners in the Islamic Republic to avoid global isolation. Speaking at an economic forum in the eastern city of Vladivostok, Russian President Vladimir Putin proclaimed that the West's attempt to push Russia off the global stage would be impossible since Moscow intends to deepen its access to markets in the Middle East and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Even though some want to isolate Russia, as we've always said, that is impossible to do. You just need to look at the map. As I said earlier, we are now without a doubt focused on developing our infrastructure in the East and also developing the international North-South corridor and our Black Sea and Azov ports. We will not forget about this. This will open new possibilities for Russian companies to access markets in Iran, India, countries of the Middle East and Africa, and of course also to supplies coming from these countries. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. It is important to highlight that TV7 Israel is a donation-based ministry. Therefore, if you are blessed by our productions, please consider making a financial contribution that in turn will enable us to sustain our ongoing operations. Additionally, I would like to encourage you to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters worldwide for the peace of Jerusalem and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan, wishing you an Erev Mevorach, and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.